if you can start off by telling us a bit about who you are, what you do, and how you came to specialize in thyroid health. Sure. My name is uh, uh, Dr. Eric Balcavage. Uh, I originally started out as a chiropractor and um, had no, uh, no attention of doing anything with thyroid physiology. I mean, my background before I went to chiropractic school was as a medical technologist. So, you know, I studied blood work and we did all that testing. So my, my background was medical and very in engaged in lab work. Um, but a, a car accident kind of changed the trajectory of my life. And I wound up going to uh, chiropractic school and got out into chiropractic world. And I thought that's what I was going to do. And then I had a family member uh, get diagnosed with hypothyroidism and, and um, fibroids and anemia. And uh, I was asked to, you know, provide some insight as to how, how I was going to help her. And I didn't, I said, I, I, I don't know, because I don't know anything about thyroid physiology more than a little bit of cursory stuff I got in school and in my medical technology training. So um, I started digging into the science, into the literature, and trying to find the solutions, um, trained with some of the you know, bright minds, it's especially at the time, Dr. Dadis Karazian, is, uh, Datis Karazian was, is, was teaching on this stuff, and, and, and so I got involved in that, and I wound up finding out you know, that this thyroid condition was really an autoimmune condition, and then identifying, hey, what we really need to do is not just flood the body with more thyroid hormone, but we need to probably get to the root of the thyroid condition. And so in helping that family member and then discussing thyroid stuff that I was learning with my chiropractic patients, just as conversational stuff, I started realizing how many of those people that I was talking to on a regular basis had already been diagnosed with hypothyroidism or thought they had a thyroid condition, um, still weren't feeling great. And that's what kind of drove me down that pathway to say, man, I need to take a look at this a little bit more. And as uh, I got, the more I got into it, the more I became a geek into the science and the physiology and the mechanisms. And that slowly and progressively led me to where I am today, which is where I really focus primarily on thyroid physiology aspects. And I think my thought process on thyroid physiology is, is definitely different than the allopathic model. It is to some degree different than the functional medicine model as well. And I'm trying to get that model out there. So my friend and, and colleague, Dr. Kelly Halderman and I have, have a book coming out uh, called The Thyroid Debacle this spring. And we're going to try and uh, get more people to understand what hypothyroidism really is. And that's really, as, as I like to say, a, a spectrum disorder and not just this gland thing. It's way, way beyond that. And which is one of the reasons why so many people continue to struggle with hypothyroidism uh, and continue to struggle with hypothyroid symptoms despite being diagnosed hypothyroidism, put on thyroid medication, they're still struggling. And so we want, I need the lay person to understand that it's a real thing. It's not in their head. They're not making it up. It, there's, a, there's a problem with their thyroid signaling at, at the cell level is still occurring. And the best way to fix a thyroid physiology problem is not more thyroid hormone in most cases, but to really truly address the root cause issues. And those things stem well beyond just a leaky gut and, and gluten intolerance. Okay? Absolutely. Yeah. And I think people are realizing that now they, they're doing all of the gut testing. They've healed their gut 20 times and the thyroid antibodies still aren't budging. So there's obviously more to the picture and we'll obviously get into your approach to thyroid um, thyroid disorders, but do you have any statistics as to how prevalent this is? And I believe it affects more women than men. Um, so is there like a average age that this tends to be a problem for? And like, as the like one in ten of us have it? Do you have any numbers like that? So the res the research says it's probably one in somewhere around one in ten women, and maybe and to a lesser degree men right, that, that, that have hypothyroid issues. Um, and the issue is when you look at the literature and the research, um, it's all over the place. You know, there's this general consensus that about 10, one out of 10 women uh, or 10% of the population overall um, is going to have uh, a thyroid problem in their lifetime. Well, what does that mean, right? What does that really mean? Because when you look at the statistics of primary hypothyroidism, when the gland becomes totally dysfunctional, 
statistics are somewhere in about three to five percent of the population. Subclinical hypothyroidism, uh, which is where TSH is elevated and T4 is normal, there's some literature that's saying it's maybe closer to 30% of the US of the population in general. Um, and I think there's another hidden form of, of hypothyroidism that probably impacts so many more people, and that's called cellular hypothyroidism or tissue hypothyroidism. And I, I think it, if we're fair, I think that number is probably closer to 50% of the population. Uh, and there's no science on that. It's just an estimate. When you look at the conditions that people have, and understand the impact of thyroid hormone at a cellular level, um, there's, it's almost impossible that they don't have a cellular hypothyroid condition. I'll give you an example. Like obesity is a major problem, right? Probably in the US, it's probably closer to 50% of the US population has some level of overweight or obesity. Well, thyroid hormone plays a massive role in metabolism and the state of your metabolism. So if there's cellular levels, of or a deficiency of thyroid hormone in the cells at the cellular level, you're going to store more fat. Okay, you're going to have a harder time with blood sugar regulation. There's a there's a growing population of people with diabetes and pre-diabetes. Thyroid hormone is critical inside the cells, not the bloodstream, inside the cells for glucose transport. So without th a sufficient levels of thyroid hormone in the cells, your cells either at a basal level become glucose resistant, right? They can't get glucose into the cells and blood sugar rises, which drives up insulin. And you, for insulin signaling, like post meal, you have to have sufficient levels of thyroid hormone. So there, it's almost impossible to have insulin resistance, pre-diabetes or diabetes, without having a cellular hypothyroid condition. And so if those numbers of obesity and diabetes are climbing into the 50% level of the population, then cellular hypothyroidism has to be a, a bigger thing and it's hidden and nobody's looking for it or, or testing for it. So therefore it doesn't exist, but it does. Absolutely. If you think of how many problems the diabetes can lead to, it's just like a knock on effect of complications and diseases that it's putting you at risk of. Yeah. And we look at diabetes like it's the problem, right? It becomes a problem. But we, we have to take a step back and say, but why is it a problem, right? Why is the person resistant? Why is their glucose building up in their bloodstream? Why is it resistant? Why is the cells not listening to insulin? Is it just because you eat too much food? I, I don't know. Does that make sense? Well, do you, everybody knows somebody who sits across the table from them who eats twice the volume that they do, and somehow they're not obese or overweight. How is that possible? How could the person eat that much and not be diabetic or pre-diabetic. There, there's a signaling issue within the cells that really must be at the root. And that's what we need to get to, right? If it was just food, right? Then the easy answer is just change the food, right? And that doesn't work for everybody. So there must be a signaling issue. And I, I guarantee where you are, it's the same as I am. There are people that come to see us and say, listen, I'm eating a gluten-free whole food diet, I'm exercising every day, and I cannot lose weight, right? Yeah. There's a signaling yeah. problem. So it can't all be just the food or lack of exercise. There must be a signaling issue going on. And I think one of the biggest things we have to consider is that the body is not making mistakes when it comes to this. The body is doing something as more of a protective mechanism, there must be some type of threat. There must be a reason the body is saying, hey, don't bring that glucose into the cell. Store that excess, car that excess fuel as fat because we're going to need it later. But right now, we can't utilize it, so we're going to store it. We don't look at it like that, I don't think, too, uh, too much mm -hmm. in, the current, um, in the current paradigm of medicine. And what are some of those reasons? What are some of the reasons that may create that cell stress? Yeah. Good question. Well, could be diet, right? It could be food sensitivities, food intolerances, potentially, right? It could be infections, bacterial, viral, other organisms. It could be toxicity, and we are bombarded with toxins, right? Um, it could be poor breathing habits, and nobody really likes to hear that because uh, that seems like, oh, then it's my fault. It's not anybody's fault, but poor respiration, okay? Especially mouth breathing, especially mouth breathing at night creates hypoxia, which induces hypothyroidism. Uh, it could be um, 
tr past trauma. It could be current trauma. It could be emotional stress, whether it's real or perceived. And more of the issue is how you per perceive it. It could be too little physical activity. It could be excessive physical activity can drive an issue as well. Dietary issues can be a trigger. So there's lots of potential triggers uh, that could cause it. But ultimately, something is telling your, your cellular system that there's danger. Mm -hmm. And when there's danger, uh, the, cells, the cells have two main, uh, kind of two main things they do. They're either in growth and development or they're in cell protection. And they don't do them well at the same time. Right? If there's a threat, what's going to typically happen is the body's going to slow down growth and metabolism and ramp up the inflammatory immune response, right? If somebody broke into your house while you were cooking food for your family, would you just continue to cook food and you know, serve everybody? Or would you stop cooking? The food may burn because you're trying to protect your family and friends, right? Yeah. The cells are doing the same thing. If they perceive threat, they're going to they're gonna slow down metabolism and they're going to up ramp up the immune inflammatory response. And all of that has thyroid hormone as a regulat regulatory piece. So we downregulate metabolism by deactivating thyroid hormone. We help support upregulation of the immune inflammatory system by doing some of this downregulation of thyroid hormone. It's, I don't think, I don't look at it like a mistake. I look at it more of a, the, the beauty and the innate intelligence of a system trying to protect itself. And I've heard more the connection with um, cell danger response in terms of Lyme disease and chronic infl inflammatory response syndrome, SIRS. And would that be more of an extreme version? And does hypothyroid come under that as well? No, no, no. At the cellular level, it doesn't really necessarily matter what the insult is, right? I'm sure there's different, there are different signaling mechanisms that occur. But if we think big picture, if you're hypoxic, that's a cell that, that can trigger the cell danger response. Not it's one night, but if it's a persistent thing, right? If it's, if you have toxicity, you have a if you're sleeping on your bed that's full of uh, chemicals that are off-gassing and you're breathing that in every day, or you're putting products on or in your body that are toxic to the system, that's going to trigger a cell danger response. If you are traumatized uh, early on in life uh, and you never fully address what those that trauma was that can become a persistent cell danger response okay. um if if it's an infection same thing so the 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 idea and dr robert navio writes about this quite a bit is that you know the body is the cells are not stupid right they are doing um what they need to do to protect themselves whether it's lime whether it's mold toxicity whether it's whatever it is the body is in this state of protection or growth and metabolism, and it doesn't do both well. It, it can do both together in a small level, right? It can keep the balance, but it's when we have progressive or extensive amounts of negative stressors that can really push us into that danger, in that danger uh, cell response. Mm -hmm. And I often give the so similar analogy with high cortisol levels like people are just giving herbs and nutrients to reduce cortisol when a lot of the time it's your body trying to adapt to maybe an infection or chronic inflammation and if you suppress that you could actually make the person worse so i agree yeah it's a huge problem like just throwing thyroid more thyroid medication at it isn't going to help yeah and i think that's part of that's why labs have to be interpreted versus read right so you can get a lab report and sometimes people just scan it for high or low. And then what's the protocol in medicine or functional medicine to fix that? Uh, cortisol is low, low, let's do something to boost up cortisol. Cortisol is high, let's do something to suppress it, right? Um, and I think knowing that cortisol is high or low is good. I also think taking the step back and saying, okay, why would the body do this? And what do we do to work with the body versus work against what the body's trying to do? If you have a high wipe count, yeah, you can take an antibiotic and try and wipe something out. But the high wipe count isn't abnormal, right? In this situation, the, the high wipe count is a totally normal response to an infection. So really what we need to say is, all right, what do we do to help support 
the elevated weight count and the infection. Do we, is it appropriate in this situation to do something antibiotic, antimicrobial, or do we support the immune system to do what it's supposed to do and that white cell come, count comes down on its own? I like to think about what can we do to work with the body more than to work against the body, right? And when we go look at labs, whether this is a, a lay person listening to this or there's a, somebody who's a nutritionist or a functional medicine practitioner or an allopathic physician, we have to consider a couple things when we look at a lab value. We have to look at, we have to consider the person's symptoms and their history in relation to those labs. And a lab value could be normal and appropriate. If you feel fantastic and your lab values are normal, they're probably appropriate. You could have a totally normal lab value, uh, but it's totally inappropriate for how you feel. If you're tired, if you're fatigued, if you feel lousy and you're gaining weight and somebody says, but your TSH is normal, well, it may be normal but it's not appropriate for how I feel. And so we then have to ask what might be artificially suppressing that TSH into normal range that makes sense for my patient. Well, they're on metformin. Oh, well, metformin will suppress TSH. Oh, they have chronic inflammation in the, in the system. That'll suppress TSH or any num other number of things. And then we also can look at a lab value that's abnormal. And instead of trying to hammer it back in place with a medication, which does make the value look better, but it doesn't necessarily mean we fix the problem. We have to say that value is abnormal. This person right now has a high TSH. Does that mean I need to support them? Or does that mean that the immune system or the inflammatory process or whatever's going on in the body is doing that on purpose to ratchet up thyroid hormone production? And if I artificially uh, provide hormone, have I, have I, circumvented what the body is actually naturally trying to do. So a lab value could be abnormal, but totally appropriate for how a person feels. And that way, then we have to make the best decision as to way to do it. Do we hammer it back in or do we work with the system? And then the last thing we have to consider when we're looking at labs is that a lab value could be abnormal and totally inappropriate for how a person feels. If we get a lab value back and their CRP is 40 when it should be less than three or less than one, depending on the type it's done, and the person says, I feel great, we have to consider that the person feels great, but the lab is way out of range. This is a person we need to do a, a, a more significant evaluation because maybe we should be looking for cancer in this person that they're not aware of or some type of disease process they're just not aware of yet. So those are the things that need to be considered when we take a look at labs and we take a look at our patient. We can't, we can't let the lab take trump what a patient feels. We have to look at those things in conjunction. And then one more thing for the lay person who's sitting there listening to this and saying, well, my labs are all normal. Well, I just laid out part of the problem that just because they're normal doesn't mean it's appropriate. But the other piece is most people don't get what I call a comprehensive lab panel done. Mm -hmm. and so they meet all the labs your doctor ran could be normal by their standard. But if, when we look at it, if you didn't have inflammatory tests measured, then you can't evaluate or manage it. What gets measured gets managed. So if you don't look at a more comprehensive panel or your doctor doesn't run a more comprehensive panel, then they, you can look good on paper because there was only one test done. Your thyroid physiology is good because we only looked at one test. Well, did you run all the others? No, because they're not important to me and my model. Well, then you don't really know how my thyroid physiology is. Um, if, you, if you don't look at somebody's blood pressure, how do you know you, they don't have high blood pressure? Well, they look good. Okay. But did you measure it? No. Then you don't know if they have high, normal, or low, right? So we, ha what we have to measure to be able to evaluate and to be able to manage appropriately. And what are these markers that you believe need to be run for a full thyroid investigation? Well, I think we, the full thyroid panel is key, but I think you have to run a comprehensive metabolic panel along with it. So from okay. a thyroid panel, TSH, obviously, T4, T3, free T4, free T3. Um, you'll get T3 uptake, reverse T3, and then you want to look at antibodies as well. Um, you could look at a couple other things, thyroid binding globulin, um, that you can also get a look at that through the T3 uptake. So those, those are pretty much the standard comprehensive thyroid panel. But 
the rest of the, the metabolic panel becomes critically important because we want to see what a when we look at lab when i look at labs i want to see does this person have some level of a thyroid disorder right um and in the allopathic model they would say that a thyroid disorder begins when tsh rises above the lab range now here's the problem there's arguments within the medical community as to what the appropriate level of tsh is right so what's the optimal range what's the optimal range what's the appropriate range and then what's the range at what we start treating? There's disagreement in the medical community as to what that value, what that range is. So they have a hard time determining that. Um, but the other thing that becomes important for me is, uh, oh, what I, I know what I was gonna say on that topic is, in allopathic medicine, a thyroid condition doesn't start until TSH rises above the lab range and T4 drops below the lab range. Then you have primary hypothyroidism, then you have a thyroid condition, then we provide treatment. But what the literature shows is that you have to have greater than 90% destruction of the thyroid gland before TSH rises out of range and T4 drops. So is that the beginning of a thyroid condition? Right? No. no late that's stages. The, right. That's the date, that's the late stage. The thyroid gland is shot at this point. It's not producing thyroid hormone. That's like waiting to help somebody with diabetes who's got a blood sugar regulation problem until they become diabetic or we're not going to help your your chronic gi symptoms until you have crohn's colitis or celiac disease right we see that all the time like you don't have a gluten issue until you have celiac what well why don't i just remove gluten then well how are we going to determine if you have a gluten issue if you don't develop celiac well if i remove it and i feel better isn't that good nope you got to keep eating it because we got to we're going to we have to wait yeah. until you're you have celiac. Well, what yeah. are you going to do once you determine I have celiac? We're going to take you off gluten. Well, then why would I want to do it anyway, right? Yeah. So the Crazy. model, it's not doctors per se, it's the model that's broken. It's very good at acute care. It's not good at healthcare. Hmm. And so if we look at, we want to see if they have a glandular problem, well, then we also want to see, do they have a cellular thyroid resistance or a cellular hypothyroid condition, which we take a look at at something called reverse T3, which is the deactivated form of T4. We can look at T3 to reverse T3 and free T3 to reverse T3 ratios for clues of it. Um, and then we can also take a look at other lab tests, like are you insulin resistant? Is your cholesterol elevated? Are there inflammatory markers that would cause that deactivation of thyroid hormone? So a the rest of that comprehensive thyroid panel um, can give you more insight than one test on its own. I, I think a TSH test is important, but I think where allopathic medicine is getting it wrong is that they fully believe that it's the best test and the only test needed to uh, assess thyroid physiology. And that's just not true. And the literature shows that. And it's not even a good marker of early dis disease or dysfunction of the gland, as I already pointed out. And the other thing is, is that they were, there's some science or literature or research showing that TSH is a good marker, an early marker of thyroid disease. Well, it's not clearly, but you can develop thyroid nodules and still have a perfectly normal TSH. Well, if you're developing the nodules, isn't that a form of damage or disease to the gland? And it, how could that, how could TSH be the sensitive marker of gland function if it doesn't detect the simplest thing like the nodules developing? So yeah, I think we run a full thyroid panel. I think we need to run a more a, a real comprehensive metabolic panel that looks at our insulin markers, our blood sugar markers, our liver markers, our inflammatory markers, our vitamin D, 25, 125, our magnesium levels, both serum and RBC magnesium. So we need a complex panel. We a good blood panel should be a very complex panel, 30,000 foot view of the chemistry, so we can say. Yeah, you have a thyroid issue going on. It's cellular and autoimmune at this point. It's not glandular at this point. The gland's still hanging in there. So now that we know that's going on, we now need to identify why that's going on. What's the thing that's triggering it? And two, we have to look at what other systems have become compromised as a result of this cell stress, cell trauma, cellular hypothyroid state, maybe the activation of the immune system, what other systems 
not only do we have to remove those, those stressors, but what systems might we have to help support regain their, their normal homeostatic regulating system, the more, the get back to the, how they should operate, not how they should operate under stress and trauma. Just before we move on as well, I just want to ask a bit more about thyroid nodules, because I don't think that's discussed commonly. Why do some people develop those and how are they assessed? Is it through ultrasound? So the thyroid nodules can, can develop for a number of reasons, okay? Immune issues, inflammation, iodine deficiency, there's a number of things that can create the nodules to develop. Um, the best way to assess them is gonna be some diagnostic testing, like a diagnostic ultrasound could be one of those things, a biopsy of the nodule can be another option. Um, but that is, if you have them, I think you definitely go get allopathic evaluation of those. I think that's, that's the wheelhouse for, for allopathic intervention here is to say, okay, let's make sure that there's no, um, we, we don't have cancer, we don't, you know, let's understand what's going on here. Let's do our due diligence from an acute care model. But in the meantime, then we have to say, what are we going to do to evaluate why this happened? We, I think it's, I think it's naive of us in, in functional medicine to say we don't have to, we're not worried about any pathology, uh, and we're just we're just going to manage it all here. I think I think we're not doing the best thing for our patients. If we see a potential reason um, of may, of concern, right? We need to make sure that we're doing the best for our patients. Saying, hey, that could be something more sinister. It may be too advanced at this point. Let's get that looked at. Let's make sure that we can rule out that that's a pathology that we have to deal with like right now. And if that's the, and if it does need to be addressed right now, we need crisis care, let's do that. If it's not something that needs crisis care, then let's manage it and then fix the causes. And that's where I think functional medicine and allopathic medicine, if we could um, come to a mutual understanding that we each have our role, uh, acute care, the allopathic care is great in the acute care model and functional medicine is great in the healthcare in the healthcare model. Absolutely. And I know that hypothyroid, so low thyroid function, is more prevalent than hyperthyroid, but do all of these similar tests and um, principles apply in terms of cellular resistance, or is that something completely different? So the overlying so the broad picture, hypothyroidism or hyperthyroidism tend to be both autoimmune conditions, okay? So big picture thinking, again, manage the crisis, right? And then get to the root issues. If somebody's got hyperthyroidism, there are things that are triggering that immune response, but based on maybe their genetic makeup, they may favor the hyperthyroid state over the hypothyroid state. They may have Hashimoto's, which is creating maybe a, uh, an ebb and flow of both situations but I don't think the fundamental principles change. Acute care management, and then get to work on the underlying root cause issues. Yeah, and before we mention symptoms with blood sugar and insulin issues, weight issues um, as symptoms of thyroid issues, could you give some more examples about different body systems and how a sluggish thyroid can affect so many things? Yeah, I mean, we could, you could, you could go to any tissue. Thyroid hormone is critical to almost everything. And we talk about, you know, we could talk about digestive function. You need thyroid hormone in the cells of the GI of the stomach to produce stomach acid. You need, you need thyroid hormone to support bile physiology. You need thyroid hormone to support pancreatic uh, enzyme output. You need thyroid hormone to maintain the movement and the integrity of the GI tract to maintain the tight junctions. Um, you need thyroid hormone for every aspect of uh, liver function and physiology. You need thyroid hormone for um, the regulation of your hormones, uh, whether they're adrenal hormones, estrogen, testosterone. Uh, you need thyroid hormone to regulate brain function and your sympathetic and your parasympathetic nervous system. Every tissue, every system in the body pretty much has receptors for thyroid hormone, and it's critical. And so the other thing to kind of keep in mind is that thyroid hormone when it binds to thyroid hormone receptors inside the cells, can either activate genes and enzymes, or the thyroid hormone can, or lack of thyroid hormone uh, can activate things. So sometimes thyroid hormone's turning things on, sometimes thyroid hormone's keeping things off. And so there is, 
it's that level of thyroid hormone in the cell that becomes critically important. And I think the biggest thing that we, we kind of forget. So you mentioned as well that thyroid hormone is important for the creation of stomach acid and the creation of bile. But how do these two things affect thyroid hormone production? So it works both ways, doesn't it? So how does not having good bile affect thyroid health? Well, if you have poor bile signaling, you're, it's, there, there is a direct impact of bile acids that circulate in the bloodstream on the conversion of T4 to T3. So you have uh, receptors that are called TGR5 receptors on lots of cells, tissues. Um, and when bile, when bile is uh, reabsorbed from the GI tract, that circulating bile actually binds to those receptors, converts T4 to T3. So it helps with the metabolism. So if you're eating and you're recycling a bunch of bile acids and they're in the system, that's actually telling the tissues, hey, we're going to increase the metabolism of your tissues to burn up more fuel because we're, you're eating. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so if you have poor bile physiology, then you don't absorb as much bile acids maybe back into the system. Then you don't can do the conversion of T4 to T3 and your metabolism slows. Mm -hmm. So everything, and for, the, for your listeners, it, it may all start to sound convoluted, but that is how your body works. It is a physiologic web of interaction. It is nice to, you know, we learn in school and your doctor may say, yeah, your thyroid gland makes thyroid hormone. It goes in your bloodstream. It goes into your cells and binds to receptors and your metabolism is good. So all we have to do is put plenty in. Uh, and it's just willy nilly that your thyroid gland shuts down. No, thyroid regulation to make it and then to have it be functional is so complex. And there's so many things that can impact it that it's mind boggling. And so you can't just look at thyroid physiology on its own and say, well, I'm just going to look at this narrow window because the, it, the, 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 the physiology is just way too complex to look at it that way. It does make it easier to explain in a diagram. It does make it easier to explain to the patient, I just got to put enough of this stuff in the system and it'll work. Um, and it, it may make it easier. Uh, just simplify treatment but it's not the reality of how how thyroid physiology is in the body yeah and even with someone who specializes in the area like yourself you aren't just looking at the thyroid you're looking at the whole picture and i think that's where the conventional practitioners can go uh, wrong with endocrinology they're only just focusing on the the um, glands of the body and like it is very complex Complica complicated and complex and that's why you have to like dedicate your life to it and figure out every single thing that's going on uh, so i appreciate the work that you're doing and like spreading the knowledge about it because it's just so hard to keep up with and it seems like there's research coming out every week or so on thyroid which is great but a little a little overwhelming if i'm honest and i think yeah and i think if you if, for the listeners if you think about it from your thyroid gland does make thyroid hormone right? Um, and, but ultimately, what drives hypothyroid symptoms is insufficient amounts of something called T3 hitting the receptors in your cells. And so in allopathic medicine, the assumption is, is that if the gland's not making enough thyroid hormone, then there's not enough T4 and T3 getting to the cells. Therefore, there's not enough in the cells. And that's the only mechanism that can result in hypothyroidism. And I would agree, if there's no, if the thyroid gland is not making thyroid hormone, then the, then the cells are probably gonna be deficient. I mean, if there's no gas in your car, the car's not gonna run, right? It can't run if there's no gas. But what medicine and the allopathic model misses is that you could have a perfectly normal gland, but something may prevent thyroid hormone production, estrogen, toxins. You could have plenty of T4 being released from the gland, but and it's bound to proteins, but something is preventing that bound hormone from becoming free hormone that can get into the cells. You can have free hormone in the bloodstream, but something is impeding that th free thyroid hormone from getting into the cell. It's not a diffusion process like it goes from high concentration to low concentration. It's energy dependent. 
And then once that T4 and T3 is in the cell, that T4 and T3 can be either activated or deactivated, right? And then there are things that can impede the T3 binding to the receptors, okay? And so that's a lot of what ifs. So for the layperson, if you don't have gas in your car, the car's not gonna run. We're all in agreement of that. But the other piece of it is, if you look at the other side of it, could you have a full tank of gas, but your car still not run? Medicine doesn't look at it from that perspective. And I would say, yeah, you may not have the key in the ignition. You may not have oil in the car. Maybe there's no spark plugs. Maybe the oil filter or fuel filters clogged. Maybe there's no engine, right? There's so many ways that the car might not be running if the gas tank is full. Same thing with your thyroid physiology. There are so many ways that you could have a healthy thyroid gland, at least initially, but the thyroid hormone not get to the tissues appropriately and cause symptoms. And that piece is missed. And so what we want to do in the model that I discuss is let's talk about the cell because ultimately it is lack of thyroid hormone in the cell that's causing your symptoms. And if we, if we redefine hypothyroidism more about what the complexity of thyroid hormone versus just that the gland doesn't make enough, now we can have a totally different conversation, right? We can have a totally different conversation about why you have chronic symptoms that is different than what the current model is. I mean, right now, if somebody has hypothyroidism and they go to their doctor and their TSH is normal, their doctor is gonna say, hey, you're good, right? There's no problem. That would be going to a mechanic and saying, hey, my car's not running, and then having to look at the gas tank and say, nope, gas tank's good, it's gotta run, right? Yeah. Or yeah. you go, hey, my car's not running, they go, oh, yep, your gas tank's half full. We'll fill it up and it'll run better. Really? None of us would agree, none of us would, we'd all be like shaking our heads if that was a mechanic, right, in our car. But yet when it comes to our bodies, we're, 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 we're that same, we're not making that same link. And it's, it, to be fair to the layperson, how do they know? They're putting all their trust in, uh, in a doctor who they're hoping is looking at it from a more complex perspective versus this very linear top-down model. And I think that's really what has to change. Absolutely. And I love that analogy. I've not heard it explained like that before, but I think it's perfect. And that should be taught in medical school. Hopefully in the next 50 years, maybe things will change. I know it's very slow and that's very frustrating, a whole nother subject. But um, with the autoimmune piece as well, you said that autoimmune thyroid issues are the most common drivers of hyper and hypothyroid. Why is it that some people don't have thyroid antibodies, even if they do have Hashimoto's? So the immune system has got, there's two aspects to the immune system, the adaptive and the innate immune system. And for many people who are, um, who have Hashimoto's, it's not driven by the antibody side producing, um, the antibody producing side of the immune system. So they've got immune attack, their tissues being, uh, it's being impacted and they've got this destruction going on but it's not being driven by the antibody side. And many times what you see in those patients, you know, as a clinician, you know that there's an attack on the thyroid gland, you assume that it's an immune-based attack. And what, you, what happens is as you start to, as you help these people get healthier, where they didn't have antibodies before, but as they actually feel better and start functioning better, they're like, hey, now my antibodies are positive. Am I getting worse? No, you're actually balancing out your immune system. And so that's a great sign. Not that we wanna see the antibodies, but it helps. But that person needs to understand this isn't the bad thing. You just had it, you just weren't, the side of the immune system that creates antibodies just wasn't functioning, okay? Mm -hmm. And so that's the biggest thing is that it's actually, it's actually hidden. And many times you won't see those antibodies rise and actually until you start getting your immune system healthier and more balanced. Yeah, so everyone should just assume that they, everyone with thyroid issues should just assume that it's, um, autoimmune in nature and with 80 plus percent of the immune system living in the gut what are your first steps to optimizing gut health do you do any testing any um do you see any infections being more prevalent with connection to the thyroid issues yeah so it's i mean i i, I would look at a comprehensive metabolic panel look for clues of gut issues malabsorption inflammation um infections that we could see on a comprehensive lab panel um, elevated BUN, you know, mar other markers of oxidative stress. And then if, especially if the person um, 
has GI symptoms, then you could do a, a, some type of GI assessment. And whether somebody prefers an organic acid test, which is not GI specific, but gives insight to infection uh, and malabsorption, or they wanna do a stool ecology test, like a GI map test, a test like that can help understand. Um, and then we, and so if we do it, like let's say we do a test, like a GI map test, that's looking at a, which is a functional test of the GI system, and we see bacterial overgrowth, then is there a high probability that bacteria in the GI tract could be part of the problem? Yes. Could that bacteria in the GI tract be causing, uh, could that bacteria be translocating into the body proper and causing a problem? Yes. Could the um, exoskin or the outside shell of those organisms be tra triggering uh, immunity, inflammatory, autoimmune, and hypothyroid issues? Absolutely. There's something called LPS, lipopolysaccharides, there's the, from the gram negatives and the, and the LTA from the gram positives. Both of those can trigger the immune response and trigger inflammatory cascade and then cause the slowdown. Um, we might look at, so it could be bacterial, could be yeast, could be viral, could be uh, parasitic, number of things that could be going on in the GI tract. I also take a look at, you know, what are the functional markers? Do we have pancreatic insufficiency? Do we have bile insufficiency? Uh, do we have chronic inflammation? Is there food reactivity? I pretty much assume that almost everybody who's got some level of GI symptoms is gonna have some level of food reactivity. Uh, that's, and so uh, typically what I'm trying to do is initially with somebody is I'll put them on more of an autoimmune or um, more of an autoimmune pro based protocol diet to just to, to kind of get the base. And then we work off of that. Do we need to be more strict? Do we need to remove other things? Do we need to, how do we vary it? But that's a good base starting point. And then my, my perception is, is that we give some acute care support for stomach acid, for bile, for pancreatic enzymes to support the innate immune system, which the body has, secretory IgA system, and those acids and enzymes are part of that innate response to keep bacteria in check. Um, and you could use short-term antimicrobials. I don't believe in long-term antimicrobial use because, the, again, if there's bacterial overgrowth, I, I don't, it, we can label it dysbiosis and say that's the problem. But again, I take it one step further and say, but why is the bacteria overgrowing? What piece is allowing the bacteria to overgrow? Uh, because if I just give antimicro antimicrobials, whether it's antibiotic or antimicrobial ongoing, I'm going to kill off a lot of the good bacteria. And I'm going to allow opportunistic organisms to overgrow. And so that's not a long-term solution. It's okay, I think, short-term, but then I think we have to address most of it by what's the diet and lifestyle factors that may be creating more GI distress? What are the medications that somebody's taking that may be causing the distress? Is there a low acid, low bile, low pancreatic function? Support those and then fix why those things are low to begin with and then support healthy restoration of flora in the GI tract long-term. I see that too with conditions like SIBO, um, with it being a more recurring issue, even naturopaths and nutritionists and um, functional medicine doctors are just giving herbs instead of anti uh, antibiotics. So they're just doing the same model as the conventional treatment, just round after round after round, and no one's taking a, a bigger picture look at the gut, whether it's bile flow or stomach acid. So that is a key point too. And on the nutrition side of things, um, there's a lot of argument, I think, with carbohydrates and thyroid health. So there's, because of the insulin resistance, maybe that's going alongside and the blood sugar issues, people say it's best to limit them, even turning more towards a carnivore or keto diet for thyroid health. But then there's the other people who are like, no, your thyroid needs carbohydrates like every three hours you need to fuel it what's your stance obviously everyone's different but what are your thoughts on carbohydrates with thyroid health yeah so one of the issues <laughs> is the answer could be yes to all of those right if this is very bio individualized so when i when i'm working with somebody I, again i start with more of an autoimmune paleo or autoimmune protocol diet and then work off of that some people may do better on a high like on a carnivore diet. Some people maybe do better on a fat, higher fat diet. Some people may really need that 
extra carbohydrate to regulate things appropriately. But it is an individual based thing. And it is based on uh, what's going on with other factors in the body. But I don't, I'm, I don't necessarily shy away from a, um, I don't shy away from like short term use of any one of those diets. I am cautious and concerned uh, sometimes when people do, like if somebody wants to be ketogenic, is that good or is that bad? I don't know. We have to see. Definitely when you're in ketosis, it does change your thyroid physiology and the, and the, and the signaling short term. Um, but we have to see what's best for the individual. I think what we've done with a lot of those things is we're, we've, we've circled the wagons and we're shooting in versus saying, hey, we need to be more open uh, to the dietary needs are based on the individual, not on a, a dogma. And so you see this too often with functional medicine. Hey, keto's the best, carnivore's the best, vegetarian's the best, um, whole food, whatever. Uh, and we've circled the wagons and shot in. And, and really the real beast here is, is that the, is the processed food industry. <laughs> and they're, they're the ones that are having the, laugh, the last laugh because they're like, look at all these idiots uh, all arguing with themselves. And if everybody just took a step back and said, hey, look, what we're all arguing for is a whole food diet, right? And if we all just ate a whole food diet and did a good job with it and just cut out the processed foods, um, most of us would be, uh, most of us would feel good and be pretty happy, right? And so the, the, I think for each individual, uh, start off with a good base, and that is more of an autoimmune paleo diet and, and start there and then work off of that. I think that's the best long-term solution for about everybody. I agree. And with autoimmune paleo, autoimmune protocol, it can be really difficult to follow a more plant-based or vegan diet. So would that be an issue for you? Like, can you work around that if someone's wanting to be more vegan or is, do you not recommend that? Um, no, I work with anybody based on what they want to do, but also based on their chemistry. So I don't have a problem with somebody trying to be a, a vegan or a vegetarian, um, but you got to be a really good one. Uh, if you're going to do it. And I, I think what we really want to shoot for is a whole food, low processed food diet with variety. And so the body is, what we want to be was what I call metabolically flexible. If you want to eat keto for a while and have, have a fire, have, fire, higher fat diet, you want to buy that can adapt to that. If you want to eat more vegetarian for a while, you, you, you want your body to adapt to that. Um, and so I think for everybody, they have uh, a set, they have a kind of a dietary standard based on their, their stress, their life factors, their choices, uh, their gut microbiome that suits them a little bit better. And we have to be open-minded enough to say, hey, even though I, I want you to do autoimmune paleo, we need to change some of this because it's not working well for you and make some of those changes. And we need to be adaptable. And if somebody is, uh, is vegetarian or vegan and they have a an emotional attachment to that style of diet, then we've got to do our best to work in that model. And that person needs to understand that, hey, to do this well and be healthy, you got to do it right. And if you're, if it's just that, you know, some things gross you out, okay, well, let's find another way around getting a, mo a more well-balanced diet into the mix. I think you can do, you can do well on any, any one of those diets, especially for a short term. I think it's where it's, we're doing it long term we get into the same habit that anybody does in a diet that we're eating the same, you know, seven to 10 meals for breakfast, the same seven, 10 meals for lunch and dinner. And we become deficient in things because of lack of variety. And it wouldn't matter if you were a carnivore or, or veggie or vegan or a whole food diet, we all do it. And it doesn't matter what the diet name is. Good point. And with nutrient deficiencies, are there any particular nutrients that are key for, um, thyroid hormone production so the conversion or the cellular uh, resistance are there any key nutrients that we need to be aware of uh, I really shy away from saying hey you need to take this or take that because it, the body's not that simple I think where most lay people need to be focused on is eat a whole food real food diet with variety 
try and eat as much as you can seasonally, uh, and and um, and that's a good start. Of the things that I think are nutrients that, if I had to pick like a nutrient that I think is critical to physiology, that I think that very few people will get uh, in trouble with doing, I think it's magnesium. I think a vast majority of us are magnesium deficient just because it's not in our in our in the soil as much as it used to be. Magnesium is needed for 600 plus enzymatic reactions in the body, and I find a lot of people deficient. It's one of those things that if it's not in the soil, it's not in the plant. It's not in the plant, it's not in the animal, it's not in the plant or the animal, it's not going to be in you. And when you really look at um, magnesium testing, not just serum, but look at RBC magnesium, um, you see that a lot of people are deficient. And even RBC magnesium isn't the best, but it's the, probably the best we have because you and I aren't going to go get muscle biopsies every other day to see where our values are. Absolutely. I agree with that. A lot of people are deficient and some can't even get enough from the diet, even if they're on the most perfect diet. So a supplement usually is um, recommended for most people, but again, everyone just check with your doctors and practitioners before just going out there and buying one. And in the thyroid world, there's a lot of controversy with iodine or iodine. What are your thoughts? My thought is, is that if you live, maybe if you live on the coast and you eat food that's grown on the coast, um, you probably have sufficient iodine. Um, but could you have iodine deficiency if you live inland, away from the coast, or you buy a lot of your food farmed in some uh, uh, area in the middle of Mexico? Uh, absolutely. So the issue is, is a couple things. We don't have great iodine testing that people can agree with, right? How do we define iodine deficiency? We don't identify it in the, in the, in the individual. Typically what we do is we say, is this overall population iodine deficient? Uh, yes, okay, then there's a problem and we just add iodine to the system. But iodine, there's a lot of controversy that surrounds iodine deficiency. There are a lot of things that inhibit iodine um, being absorbed into the system. Estrogen's one of them, which is why there's a huge tie between women and, and hypothyroidism and birth control and hypothyroidism. Because if you're taking, if you have plenty of estrogen circulating in the system, you can't get, it impacts iodine absorption. We, I don't know how it is where you are, but we've got chlorinated water and, and we got fluoride and we've got a number of things that could really impact and block iodine absorption. I just don't think we have great testing um, and that we can, that, that anybody has scientifically said this is accurate, right? Uh, there are some iodine tests available um, that, that can be done and can be used, um, but I don't think for most cases, people really need to shy away from iodine, from natural sources, food, things like that. The only thing I would be really concerned about with most patients is there are, there, is there likelihood that there's more iodine deficiency than we give credit for? I would say yes. Um, should that, does that mean everybody should go out and start popping mega doses of iodine? I would say no. But I think if eat, eat foods that, are, that should, should be richer in iodine, and if you are taking a multivitamin, it's probably not a bad idea to have some form of iodine in there. But I, don't, I, I, I would hate to have somebody go mega dosing iodine uh, really nearly without having somebody take a look at it and say, hey, this might be a possibility for you. And there are signs of iodine, that iodine deficiency. Iodine is not just used by the thyroid glands used by the immune system and a lot of your other tissues. So when a practitioner uh, considers that, hey, there may be an iodine deficiency issue, you know, they can look at some of these other markers. I think if you've got an estrogen problem, uh, there's a good possibility. If you are swimming in a chlorinated pool every day, there could be there could be an iodine issue. If you're if you're if you're using products that have some bromine or fluoride or chloride in them that could be impacting iodine transport, then there's a possibility and a probability and some level of iodine support may be warranted, but you gotta be careful because I've also had seen patients that uh, they read some, uh, a medical doctor who really proposes high dose iodine for everybody and they're, you know, next thing they know, they're, they're blowing their, their thyroid mm -hmm. gland out. So I think we've gotta be, uh, we need a better way to assess and evaluate and we need 
um, better tools, but we just don't have them right now. Yeah, there's people like lathering it all over their body, like painting the whole body with iodine, and they're like, no, you really need to know what you're doing there. Um, and then the halogens that you mentioned, so the chlorine and fluoride and bromine can displace the iodine in the body. Are there any other lifestyle or environmental things that you want to talk about? So environmental toxins or exercise, the, the relationship with stress? Yeah, so I think what we have to keep in mind is that at the root of what's triggering hypothyroidism at the cellular level, TSH normal, T4, T3 in the blood normal, but you still have hypothyroid symptoms, there's decreased T3 reaching the receptors. I think we have to consider the fact that it's not an accident. There's something triggering that response by the body. That's typically some form of cell stress. So what are those cellular stressors that may do it? And these are things that, you know, from the lay person, they can start going through this checklist of things long before they maybe reach out to a functional medicine practitioner. You know, do you sleep eight hours uninterrupted through the night? No. Okay, we'll start working on that because disrupted sleep is a stressor that then activates the fight or flight system. And if it's one night, it's not a big deal. But if it's progressive and persistent, then you need to fix that. Uh, could it be poor breathing habits? Absolutely. Poor breathing habits create hypoxia at the cells and hypoxia is going to induce cellular hypothyroidism. If it's one or two days, you get, you know, you, you breathe through your mouth over through the night, you wake up tired and fatigued, it's short-term cellular hypothyroidism. But if it's day in, day out, every night, then it may be the issue why you're struggling. Um, you've got to look at diet. If your diet is loaded with junk food and processed chemicals and all these things, that may be an issue. Clean up your diet. Start with an autoimmune paleo protocol or AIP protocol. There's so many resources that are available. Focus on real food, right? You don't need to eat every three to five, uh, every two to three hours a day. That's not necessary if you're if you have good metabolism. But if you have to do that, then you need to reach out to somebody to get some help because having low uh, glucose to your brain is just as bad as having uh, too much. Um, you want to look at your lifestyle. Like, what are your habits that you do on a daily basis that are either helping your your thyroid physiology or harming? Your thyroid physiology, right? Um, what do you do? Do you get exercise? Do you spend uh, unlimited hours on your phone and, and computer and video? Uh, is does that have an impact on health? Absolutely. You're holding your cell phone up to your thyroid, up to your ear to listen. Does that have an impact on your thyroid gland? Yeah, the literature shows it does. And so, uh, just to reduce those things, right? Um, if you have a lot of emotional stress in your life, uh, you need to come to grips with that. Uh, if it's a tra traumatic life experience, you need to address it. You can't just suppress it. You have to work with somebody to address it. But if you're in a bad relationship, a bad job, um, change it or figure out ways to adapt to it better because those are the things that, even though they don't seem major, are things that can do it. Are you an exerciser? If you're not, that can be a problem. If you're an over-exerciser, that can trigger cell stress and, and danger response as well. It did for me. Um, and so that was what triggered my Hashimoto's was, you know, training for triathlon, spending hour, you know, spending a lot of time in a pool, spending too much time training and too little time sleeping, resting and recovering. And that's a danger response. So we want to make sure that we're looking at the diet, the lifestyle, the sleep, the breathing, um, the habits, the exercise, the fitness. We want to look at all those things. And what's great about telling people to look at those things is most of those things are free, okay? And they all provide long-term results, but what you'll find if you haven't already, and I see, is most people aren't ready to go work on themselves yet. They're looking or hoping, especially in functional medicine, I'm frustrated with allopathic medicine, I wanna to come to functional medicine, give me a supplement that's gonna fix my problem. Well, that's using the allopathic model in functional medicine, you know, Replacing six medications with 12 supplements isn't a solution, a long-term solution. That's probably more expensive, right, than it is taking the medications. So that's not the answer. The answer is your, for most of us, your diet and lifestyle created your health issues, right? Trauma, diet, lifestyle created where you're at currently. So if you go back and undo those things or clean those things up, what you're going to see as it is an improvement 
of your health, right? And so in my mo model, we do very little to try and, and treat the thyroid gland. What we're always focused on is diet, lifestyle modification, and using short-term supplementation and functional tests to identify problems, boost the system, kind of help the system out, not work in place of it, and then have our patient make those changes in diet and lifestyle factors because that is what long-term changes the physiology back to what it should be. Exactly. And doing all of these things won't just help your thyroid health in the short term. They're going to help reduce disease risk in the future as well. And all of those things that you've mentioned, they're all free. Um, a lot of them seem simple. I know it's hard to implement them for a lot of people. And it may seem overwhelming, like, oh my God, where do I even start? But I think it should be empowering as well that you have all of these options to look into. But what do you think are some of the roadblocks or reasons why people um, don't want to make that change and don't book in with a practitioner or want to change their diet or keep falling quote off the band bandwagon? So a couple of those things are purpose and focus. What do you really want, right? Uh, two is fear, because they're fear of the unknown. I, I'm comfortable in what I know, even though I'm uncomfortable. I don't know what's gonna happen um, if I make these changes, right? Um, I think one of them is lack of self-respect and self-awareness. And so they are, they, they don't think they're worth it. Um, you see this a lot with moms that they're so focused on everybody else instead of themselves. And, you know, the point I try and get across is you can't give what you don't got. And so you want to be the best mom. And so you sacrifice your own health, uh, to do everything for everybody else. But in the end, that's breaking your health down. Your family's aware of that. You're more moody, more irritable, and you shorten your lifespan to be with those people. I would rather have that person be there, be selfish to some degree, take care of themselves, because when you're healthy and vibrant and radiate, you radiate your health and wellness to, the, to your community, and that becomes the ripple that becomes the tidal wave that changes health, right? It's not, a bill, it's not a capsule, it's not a bottle of anything. What changes health is health, healthy people in a, and, and the healthy community they create. Look at things like just like CrossFit. You, know, you see the community and how that change, you have so many people change as a result of that. Now there's pros and cons to CrossFit, but it's the community that's built that helps create the change. Not all the changes by people throwing weight around, most of it is just by the, by the health and the community. People wanna be around that vibrant person. And so for a lot of people, that's a big issue. Uh, I would say the other issue is people think that, they're, um, that they need more motivation to make change. Uh, motivation is a short-term thing for everybody and anybody. What most people need is better habits and, and, and more discipline to do those habits. And the only way you're going to have more discipline to do those habits is to have the right purpose for why you're doing it, right? And so, you know, I tell people, I'm not motivated. I'm like, you're not motivated because it's not what you really, you don't have your purpose set in your mind because you're scattered. You've got a whole lot of things. But if your sole for purpose and focus was on getting healthy, then you would create the habits and you'd put in and you do the discipline to get there. It really does come down to um, just, it comes down to mindset and discipline. Everybody says, well, I don't have discipline to do it. I'm that. You have discipline because you have discipline to watch video, right? You have discipline to look at your Instagram. You have discipline to look at those. You do those every day. It's just because you have the wrong purpose in mind and your, your, your discipline and habits are following either the lack of purpose, right? Or the wrong purpose. And so that becomes an issue. And I think the last is, is that people... Once sometimes people are sick and people might be upset to hear me say this, that they identify with who they are. They identify with their illness. I'm a hypo, I have hypothyroidism. I have fibromyalgia. I have X. I have sleep apnea. I have that. And they act and behave in a way to keep that consistent. Instead of saying, I'm a healthy person who's trying to get, I, I, I don't have a disease process. I have dysfunction and I'm working to get out of that. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Yeah, it's a key point. And I always try and promote that way of thinking as well. Even if you're just lying to yourself, like it's going to be hard when you first try to do that. 
um especially if you have issues with like low mood and depression it's just hard to give yourself that motivation but it really does work and your mind is powerful yeah and for for people you're not truly lying to yourself right what you want to be saying is i'm not healthy right now but my i mm-hmm. but i can be a healthy person right um the issue with labels and names is we made them up right fibromyalgia is a word we made up right so if you say i don't have fibromyalgia you're probably right because we made the term up most of these definitions of 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 what these diagnoses or names they're just names we made up so we don't even we don't there's multiple mechanisms that create what we call fibromyalgia right but it isn't something you can specifically test for so for people who have been given a diagnosis that's just a label that somebody gave you so that you can either write out a script or that they can give you a simple explanation or they can give you a get your insurance paid for it. what you really have is some level of dysfunction in the body caused by some level of cell stress that's the issue so if you say listen underneath it all i'm a i'm a healthy person but right now right now i'm not and i'm going to work towards that that then you're being honest with yourself but don't get caught up with labeling yourself like i'm a hypo, hypothyroid person or i have fibro or i'm of this that mentality will cause you to behave in a way to to continue that state does that make sense yeah Yeah. and i like the switch that you made with what i said um instead of saying i am healthy like i am vibrant and full of life because you're lying to yourself that way so i am working towards that i think that's a good Yeah. yeah a good switch amazing and before we finish up now i just want to ask a few questions about you personally just mm-hmm. on you, how you stay healthy and your day-to-day life. So the first one is, what's your go-to breakfast? I would say um, three to four days a week, I don't eat breakfast. I do time-restricted eating. On the days I eat, I am an egg man. So I will have some form of eggs. Uh, usually something like an egg scramble, um, so eggs, peppers, onions, spinach, whatever I got vegetable wise in the refrigerator gets chopped up and and thrown in there. Uh, But I would say at least four days a week, I time restrict eat. Yeah. Can you tell us quickly a bit about the benefits of that? And is this something that you recommend to um, your hypothyroid patients or not? I do. I do. I think it uh, it works really well for lots of them. Some people, they do better eating more frequently but I'd say the vast majority of people, once they get, uh, once they get it figured out and their body starts to adapt to it, um, they definitely do well. The benefits are that when you time restrict eat, you force your body to have to burn fats as fuel, you starve off the, some of the bacteria in your GI tract, so it can definitely help with, um, with dysbiotic conditions. Um, you're not constantly churning your chemistry, and I think it's, it works really well. Do you need time restrict eat every day? I don't think you do, uh, but I, I think it, doing it periodically, um, again, puts your body into a more metabolically flexible state to say, hey, I've got sugar, I can burn it. Oh, I don't have sugar, I'll burn up my fat stores. The biggest challenge, one of the biggest challenges we see with people who eat every two to three hours is they, can, they never burn up any of their fat stores. And so time restricted eating has been shown to be super beneficial in doing that. And what I see, uh, is a lot of people are like, man, I'm less hungry when I do this. I was, when I was eating three meals a day, I was always hungry. I always had to have snacks. Now I'm eating one or two meals a day and I'm, I'm rarely ever hungry and I have more energy and I'm losing weight. Yeah. Cause you're doing, you're not per se calorie restricting per se. What you're doing is just shortening the window and a lot causing your body to have to dip into the reserves. But with fasting or time-restricted eating being a stressor, even though it's a good stress, do you not see that like adding to the bucket and making someone worse? No, and there's a lot of controversy on that with hypothyroidism because the the thought process is is that you if you fast, um, that you are restricting food and then that's going to slow down thyroid physiology. The reality is it's not necessarily the case long-term. Short-term it does, and you may get some deactivation of of thyroid hormone uh, in the cells, but when you deactivate T3, 
it can form a form of, of, of what's called T2, and that T2 can drive mitochondrial metabolism. And so there's a benefit when, when fasting occurs, it's not like it's off, like the thyroid physiology. It is, is potentially there's some downregulation, but there's also conversion to what are considered active forms of T2 that can drive the mitochondria and drive metabolism. Would that be same um, with the um, nervous system response that it has as well? So stimulating cortisol and adrenaline is only a short term thing and the benefits kind of outweigh that? Yeah, absolutely. Well, when you get, you're going to have some challenges with some of the nervous system's going to kick up to, to do some work, right? That's going to help mobilize fat cells to generate energy and, to, and generate heat. Um, you're going to have cortisol upregulated to say, hey, let's take some of that stuff and let's make some glucose, right? So your body does things in the short term. Now, if you starve yourself for 14 days, right? Don't eat, that, that's longer term fast. You're going to have a more a more significant impact, but I think what we see is the more detrimental in effect on the on the on the thyroid physiology is probably what we see like the five to six small meals or snacks per day and way under doing your calorie intake because what happens is the brain never gets a signal of satiety and that is more of a danger response than than the short term hey I'm not eating it, and now I get a satiety signal i've been satisfied with my lunch and my and my dinner now hey there's no problem you know what i mean yeah. so it's the i never get this satiety signal to brain that's a danger signal i have i get the satiety signal every day every other day then my body's not in a danger mode okay yeah great and then the second question is what's one herb nutrient or supplement that you couldn't personally live without <sighs> You know, to be honest, I would say I don't necessarily have one um, because as much as I use supplements, it's not something that I, I make sure I blast myself with every day. But I would say if there was one thing that I think is probably most critically important in today's world of processed food and the way we farm would be probably magnesium. Mm, I would yeah. say that that would probably be on the top of the list. Perfect. And is there a book or resource on the rec on the subject of thyroid health that you recommend, obviously until yours comes out, um, that the listeners could benefit from? I think there's a lot of books uh, out in functional medicine regarding, you know, hypothyroidism. I think they all center, have this central focus on gut and autoimmunity and gluten, you know, as the biggies. Um, I don't know that there's, and to be fair, I haven't read in, in the last two years, I've had my head down on my own projects. So I don't know that I would say, hey, go read this book. But there are a lot of good resources out there. Um, I just think um, what, what Kelly and I have done with the book that we have coming out, we're just taking it to the next level of, of taking some of that clinical research um, by Hewerman and Dietrich and Dr. Kell and trying to bring that all into um, into this book and say, hey, look, there's reasons why thyroid physiology is being de diminished. And we have to stop just ignoring the fact that the body is pretty smart and start to look at these other factors. So I, I don't know wh what book I would push you to, towards. Obviously, Batiste's books uh, are, are excellent. Um, but other than that, I, I just don't know which book I would say to somebody, hey, go read that book. Yeah, and I'll link to um, the teasers in the show notes as well. But remind us when um, yours is coming out, what it's going to be called, if you've decided on the name yet. Yeah, the, the, the title is called The Thyroid Debacle. Um, and um, it should be out sometime in, um, I'm thinking this spring. So maybe probably closer to April. Um, if somebody's interested, I know they can go to my website and there's a sign up there um, where they can get, uh, get on the list so we can let them give them update and information on when it's coming out. And I know we're going to have a, uh, they're starting, the publisher's starting to do that, like an early sign up to pre-order books. Uh, but we should be looking forward to come out this uh, sometime probably between February and April, I'd say closer to April. Great. Yeah. And I'll show on my social media and everything as well when it comes out. And for the parting words now, a key takeaway point. So if you could summarize one key message for the listeners um, based on this episode, what would it be? 
I'd say introspection. You know, I would say spend time looking at before you go looking for a, something, a, a pill, a potion, right? The next uh, internet solution or you know, miracle, whatever it is, do some introspection. What's going on in my life that's creating more negative stress? And how do I, because you're never going to reduce or remove all the stress in your life. You just have to balance the scale, right? The teeter totter. And so if you have a lot of negative stress in your life, how do you reduce it or remove it as much as possible? And don't neglect the simple things like better sleep, better breathing, exercise, better food. Those things are critical to getting healthy and getting well. Better habits, better mindset. All those things are free. Don't take much effort and work. I didn't say they're easy, but they're all simple strategies to improve your health. And whether you're trying to fix a thyroid condition or a blood sugar condition or any condition, if you improve your diet and lifestyle factors, you're probably going to improve regardless of the condition. Absolutely. Yeah. Love that. And um, finally, just the last question would be, um, what's your website? Just remind us again of your website. And if you're on any social media, obviously I'll link to the, the um, links as well in the show notes. Yeah. So the website is rejuvagencenter.com. Um, my Facebook page is rejuvagencenter.com. My Instagram is Dr. Eric Volkavage. Um, and uh, on YouTube, I think it's Rejuvagen is for videos. I put that Thursday videos out there. I do most of my commenting, I guess, on Instagram. Um, uh, I'm trying to be, be a better social media person, but uh, I would say that's where most of my, my content is. Yeah, you're putting some really good stuff out there. I love to watch along and I think everyone should follow you on there because you learn so much and even probably more so than conventional medical doctors, which is sad to think, but it's absolutely true. And I appreciate your time today. Thank you for spending time with us and sharing this information. You're just a wealth of knowledge and I think everyone's really going to benefit from this information. So thank you, Dr. Eric. Thanks for inviting me.